happy to have you here. Um, so why don't you tell us um, a little bit about yourself, your background, and uh, what you do. And my name is Sophia Brining. I'm a lactation consultant in uh, private practice and also working as a lactation consultant at uh, St. Michael's Hospital, mainly working with uh, premature babies in NICU. Uh, also a registered nurse and Bachelor of Science in Nursing, um, uh, mainly NICU and also adult world. And in the last 10 years, I'm mainly doing breastfeeding, lactation support, um, and being a lactation consultant. Amazing. I love it. And, you know, we were just chatting before. Um, Sophia, you and I met at a business, a local business networking event. And I remember yes. you, I was very new into the world of sleep consulting at the time. And, uh, and unfortunately, any experience that I had had um, trying to connect with breastfeeding professionals was just proving that our, our, our vision was not so aligned. And then I remember you came up to me and you started you know, chatting away and said, I love what you do. And I remember going, yes. really? You do? <laughs> Again, I was very, very new. And you said, yeah, absolutely. You know, sleep training, sleep training is wonderful. It's so great to get these babies sleeping. And that was when we, I, I instantly bonded with you. I, I remember I was going, okay, I just kind of latched on to you. No, no pun intended, <laughs> but latched on to you, you know, going, oh my gosh, you know, I found myself a an extremely experienced, incredible um, lactation professional. And, and by the way, you know, for those of you who aren't Toronto based, um, St. Michael's Hospital is a very well known uh, hospital here in Toronto. Um, and so, you know, from, from then on, you know, Sophia has been my go-to person that I refer to anyone who needs uh, breastfeeding mm -hmm. support. So, you know, I'm, I'm so excited to have you here, Sophia, so that we can delve into some of the biggest myths and misunderstandings around the breastfeeding relationship and sleep. Because I think that there is this huge misunderstanding that if you want to be able to get a proper night's sleep, then the breastfeeding relationship will have to be sacrificed. And that if you don't want to sacrifice the breastfeeding relationship, then you're going to have to sacrifice sleep. So let's, let's delve into that. I mean, what are your initial thoughts on that, that, that whole topic? Okay. So my philosophy is balance in life, in mm -hmm. everything not to be too, too fanatic about any topic of your life. Yes. To try to balance everything and to create a puzzle, right, from little stuff. Um, yeah, I'll be very honest with you. Even if I'm talking to a mom of a newborn who's, uh, I don't know, 11 days old and she's working on breastfeeding and I see completely um, tired, unfunctioning woman, I would say, you know what, skip, breastfeed, skip one breastfeed at night, skip, uh, skip uh, breastfeed at 12 a.m., let your partner feed the baby, catch up some sleep. Yes. Otherwise, it's going to be very tough, right? Yes. And baby, first of all, needs not a breastfeeding mom. He needs normal, functioning, and reasonable mom. Yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> needs a happy, stable, you know, um, n normal feeling mom. One normal. Yeah. And if you are breastfeeding nonstop and you feel like it's killing me, I'm not getting enough sleep, mm -hmm. uh, baby is not sleeping enough, I would, with my own lactation consultant pants I would stop it and I would say take a break yeah because otherwise this breastfeeding is not going to continue yeah honest to god you know this when you tell these moms that you see that are just bone tired that they should really just hand the baby off to the dad take a bit of a break go to sleep get a proper stretch of sleep have the have their partner do the middle of the the, the midnight feed 
so that the mom can be a little bit more well rested. Does that end up helping with breastfeeding overall with milk supply, you know, when her stress levels are able to go down even a little bit? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because milk supply and breastfeeding, it's actually simply three things. It's stimu enough stimulation, enough hydration, and rest. Yeah. And if mom is fulfilling two of them, but she's sleeping only two hours here, an hour and a half there, and she's not having four, five hours of sleep in a row, her body is going to react appropriately. Right. Her body is going to say, I'm sorry, I'm not able to produce milk for you. And right. she can do everything right and pump enough and breastfeed enough and wake up in the middle of the night and still to deal with low milk supply. Right. So it's very advisable, I would say, if you feel like you're on the edge. Yes, I'm not talking about any hour of the night. I'm usually saying, hey, uh, let's keep the middle of the night feed because then prolactin is lower. Yeah. But if you'll sleep through this and you will be available for the baby and for the pumping at around 4, 6 a.m., we're still catching up with the um, peak of the prolactin for your better milk production. But we actually achieved two goals. You slept right. and right. you're doing it at the preferable time. Yes. Uh, so I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you the story. I'm working in NICU and it's usually mommy, mommies who are pumping, you know, every three hours and usually mm -hmm. coming from different hospitals and they're like, oh, I'm being a bad girl. I'm not pumping every two hours, 10 times a day and blah, blah. And I'm like, hey, 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 let's stop here and let's sit down and organize schedule in which probably during the day you're going to have breaks and you're going to have like two hours apart pumps. However, at the nighttime, your last, uh, uh, last pump is going to be around 11, 11.30, and then next one is going to be 4.35, which, again, will give you much more energy and prolactin hour. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about this prolactin um, topic mm -hmm. because I think this is, this is an important one. Um, when I hear a certain group of breastfeeding professionals, again, with the best of intentions, saying things along the of lines of, you should never try removing night feeds from a baby because night is the best time to be nursing a baby for milk supply, for the breastfeeding relationship, because that's when your body produces prolactin and that the, the baby, the, the breastfeeding relationship is going to be hindered by removing all of these night feeds, even if it's done gradually. How would you address that? Like, what exactly is the science behind the prolactin? And, um, and, and does night weaning actually, in fact, impact breastfeeding, the breastfeeding relationship? So first of all, what we need to do is to define night. What is night? It's 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. or it's 12 a.m. to 6 a.m. What is night? So um, usually for the baby, uh, when we're talking about like newborn, uh, if baby is sleeping around four hours or four and a half hours in a row, no matter what time of the day, for him it's night. So basically, if baby slept five hours during the daytime, obviously he's going to wake up uh, at nighttime and to ask for more food, right? right. So one of the advices that I'm usually giving uh, every parent, I'm like, if you want to address this problem, feed the baby more frequently during the day. Yes, yes. Don't let your baby feed. take a five-hour nap. As, as great as it might be, you might, you're going to end amazing. up paying the price for it at nighttime. Exactly. It's very amazing. It gives you some rest, but baby couldn't care less that you did not sleep at this time. Right. For him, it's night. Yes. Um, going back to prolactin, yes, prolactin is a breastfeeding hormone. Prolactin is a hormone that affects the milk supply, helps our body to produce some milk. Right. And yes, uh, it peaks 
uh, when it peaks, it's the best uh, productive time uh, of the day. But is it 12 a.m.? Is it 2 a.m.? Is it 3 a.m.? Do we, we don't need to sleep at this time and just be like, you know, bodyguarding and let's pump and let's feed if baby is sleeping? No, because prolactin peaks between um, 3 and uh, Three, four, uh, three to four a.m. and until even nine a.m. Uh -huh. And if mom is coming to me and saying, "Listen, not able to pump during the day. I'm doing only partial breastfeeding. When should I breastfeed?" I would say, "Okay, in the range of between four a.m. to nine a.m. Try to squeeze two to three feet. Right? Is it nice? You absolutely it's the beginning can. of the morning. Yeah." That's yeah. so doable because if you have a baby that gives you a big stretch of sleep, which again, you know, when you've got a baby in the four month range and up, you can absolutely be getting very, very big stretches of sleep, regardless of whether or not your baby is definitely or bottle feeding. And so if your baby is breastfeeding and you're worried about the prolactin, if your baby is eating once at 4 a.m. and then let's say he goes back to sleep and wakes up for the day at seven nurses at seven and then maybe nurses once more at you know nine or nine thirty before going down for his morning nap that's three feeds right exactly right that's exactly three right that, and this is exactly in, in how it fantastic works fantastic time frame yeah we in which you can sleep he can sleep and both of you can sleep definitely yeah. if we're talking not about newborn if we're talking about baby who as you said four months of age, five months of age, six months of age. Mm -hmm. If that mom will tell me that that baby is waking up every two and a half hours at the night time to breastfeed as a lactation consultant, I will tell you, mm, let's take a look on this breastfeeding relationship and let's see what is going wrong. Because right. physiologically, baby is usually starting to be sleeping much more during the nighttime. Right. And if baby's feeding as often during the nighttime, I would assume he probably is not feeding as much during the day. And yes. probably we need to feed something there, right? Yes. We've got a term I would for that in the sleep world. I don't know if you guys use this term called reverse cycling. I don't know if that's a term that well, you, you guys use. Yeah, you guys you use reverse use cycling too. Well? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, for those of you guys listening in, reverse cycling in a nutshell is basically when you have a baby on a reverse eating cycle to some degree. So you have a baby who is eating more at night than necessary. And then as a result, not eating as much during the day as he could be. And then as a result, eats more at night to compensate. And then the vicious cycle just continues. And we, I mean, I see various cases of reverse cycling that, you know, range in degree. So, you know, I've seen some babies that maybe eat a little bit more at night than necessary. I've seen babies eating 50% of their caloric intake at nighttime. I've seen babies eating 80 to 90% of their calories at nighttime and then barely eating I it all during the too. day. And the mom has no idea why this baby won't eat. And it's because when, when we're taking a look at these babies' lo feeding laws, and I see that the baby is nursing for 10 minutes at a time, five times a night, he's not hungry. <laughs> of course not. He no. fulfills all his needs during this night time. And then he's busy during the day with other stuff, right? Right. right. Um, as a result. As a result. So you're saying. So we're also coming to the question, is it really healthy? at five or six months of age to breastfeed all night long? I don't think so. No. I don't think so. And so, so you're saying it... that if a mom doesn't like the situation, if there is some degree of reverse cycling here where, you know, her four month old baby and up is eating more than, you know, once, maybe twice a night, what you're saying is, because I think this is also a very big, big myth that I would love to bust in the breastfeeding world. And that's that, so what you're saying is that there's really no problem with attempting to transfer those calories from the nighttime to the daytime. That there's nothing Absolutely. inherently superior 
about those feeds happening at 11 or 12 o'clock at night that we can potentially shift to the daytime. Absolutely. Because um, milk supply also going through some changes during that time, right? Mm -hmm. And it's more mature milk supply, less relate, less hormonally related. If we're talking about prolactin, okay. it's more related to stimulation that baby is doing. Composition of the milk changes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little bit more fatty milk that can be given during the day uh, after all yeah it is a baby but we are preparing this baby to be a toddler who is right. going to eat during the day and sleep during the night right and for some it happens earlier for some it happens later for some it hap like not happening at all and then we will we'll need to see what's going on with the milk supply what's going on with the way of feeding what's happening with that but one more thing um a lot of the times i see moms coming to me with the question but what can i do four to six months of age baby is very distracted like cannot feed him during the day not feeding doing yeah. everything else playing but not feeding what kind of advice you can give in this situation so usually i'm saying baby still napping during the um uh, during that time right mm -hmm. yes he's napping try to organize the breast feeds around those naps closer right. when he's falling asleep maybe or when he just woke up because then all his focus is going to be breast and let let me feed right also what very very helpful in this situation is to decrease amount of stimulation so yes. to go to darker places to go to um quieter places not to create very much of motion around the baby and yes. one of the reasons why baby is like feeding much better during the nighttime it's because nobody's moving and it's darker yeah correct mm -hmm. but can we fix it definitely we can fix it can we uh, move those feeds mostly for the daytime yes we can right and I think a lot of moms are afraid that if they try removing these night feeds where their baby is eating so well and they try and transfer those calories to the daytime when the baby isn't eating as well, they're afraid that breastfeeding is going to go out the window. And you're saying uh, that doesn't have to happen that way. It does not have to happen. We always... Uh, need to remember that every story is very personal and different, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if we're talking about mom whose milk supply to begin with was very low, my approach to her breastfeeding and sleeping going to be a bit different rather than mom who had successful breastfeeding, no issues with the milk supply um, uh, and other stuff. Uh, but definitely, if we're talking about mom with excellent supply, baby who's peeing, pooping, and gaining weight up until this moment, uh, and if he feeds six times at night when he's like five months old, uh, if he will move to twice at night, uh, I will be very honest, nobody would die. Yeah. Like baby, but even once will a survive. night. What about once a night? I would say too. No one. This guy's even, not gonna fall if that five month old. My my son, my son JJ. I mean, he's now twenty two months, and I'm I'm not nursing him anymore. But I had him down to one one night feed in a twelve hour period by the time he was about three months, and he was exclusively breastfed. And he gained, as far as I remember, very well. Beautifully. He was yes, a very not beautiful baby. In the weight gain department. And I just want to emphasize, you know, all three of my kids, I've, I've, I've breastfed to a certain degree. Um, I'll share my story about my first in a second. But, you know, with my, with my, my the baby number two and baby number three, there was no trouble breastfeeding. But I just want to emphasize, I do not have an oversupply. Uh, my body produces the exact amount that my baby needs and not more than that. And so I don't want it to seem like this baby of mine was sleeping through the night by three months because I've got enough milk to feed triplets. I, I, I probably don't. <laughs> or I guess maybe my body would produce it, but I mean, I'm not, 
I, I'm not one of these people that was probably a, you know, a wet nurse in my previous lifetime. I produce like exactly the amount that he needs and not a drop. Just enough. And yet with, with enough proper sleep hygiene in place and, um, and focus on particularly nursing him every two to two and a half hours during the day. It meant that he was able to give me that massive stretch of sleep very early on. And as you said, the sky didn't fall. <laughs> I nursed him until, yeah. you know, we were both done. So, um, and, and you're saying that's not out of the ordinary. No, no. And I see it in a very many cases. I also, if we're talking about uh, toddlers, right? Um, a lot of moms coming to me uh, and asking for the advice, for God's sakes, how I'm taking this baby off the boob at nighttime. Yeah. Because it's impossible. I am back to work. I need my sleep. Yes. Um, so if we're talking about habits, I think at around six months, our babies very well and very clear understand our messages so it's yes. uh, we're talking about creating uh healthy habits mm -hmm. we're sleeping at night and we're eating and doing everything else during the day yes um and i think they are ready if you'll come to me and say hey sophia is it possible to do it for mo one month old i would say obviously not absolutely no. not no, it's a different cycle. <laughs> yeah. But at the same but time, oh, sorry, go, go ahead. But when we're talking about like four to six months of age, uh, when the solid starting to come into, into the picture, when we still breastfeeding during the day, um, I will tell you even more than this. When mom is coming to me at six months with lower milk supply and saying, you know what, I'm doing A, B, C, D. However, baby is sleeping at night, like for 10 hours, you know what I'm saying? What I'm usually, my answer is don't touch the night. If you already achieved this goal of sleeping, yes. let's play around it. But I would definitely not going to tell this mom, Oh, wake the baby and breastfeed every two to three hours during the night time. No Definitely chance. not. No because, chance. yeah, because this baby needs the sleep too in order to grow, correct? Yes. And if we're already having it, then we will try to achieve the milk supply goal in other ways. Yes. And I think just, just to, you know, touch upon, um, just to touch upon, you know, the, the, the fear around potentially having low milk supply. I know I experienced this and it's a very common problem. You know, my, my second baby was my first baby that I was able to really successfully breastfeed. And I remember, you know, those first few months you're leaking, you're, you're just constantly feeling very, very full. And, cool. um, but it, it felt it felt good. It made me feel like, okay, you know, I've got milk and this is just that, you know, normal part of breastfeeding. And then I think it was around the four month mark where I wasn't constantly feeling as full and I wasn't, you know, leaking mm -hmm. as much. And it made me think, oh my gosh, is my, is my milk I'm losing drying it. up? Is my milk going away? Mm -hmm. And I know that this is a really common fear. And and I and I found out because this was you know my a first time experience for me that no, it does not mean that your milk is going down the drain. So let's let's jam on that for a second because I I, I get that you know dealing with enough moms who you know might be breastfeeding for the very first time with babies in this age range that they start to have that fear as well. So let's 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 talk about that. So the truth is that first three months of a uh, baby's life, milk production is, um, again, on demand, as per stimulation, as per hydration and rest, but also very hormonal. Mm -hmm. Our hormones for milk production are high. Yes. At around six way, weeks, they're starting, like the, it's half of the amount, and closer to three months, it's really going down. If we'll do the blood test, the prolactin is going to be almost at the normal level. Right. Why is that? Because this is a mature uh, milk production, not a hormone uh, without any hormone influence. Uh, influence. Right. Only uh, 
as much as has been taken and stimulated as much and a little bit more body is going to produce. So if the question, I'm not feeling very full means I am losing my supply, not necessarily. Yeah. It, it's mo most probably that mature lactation is happening. And yes, you are not feeling like you have a fountains in there and like you are exploding. Right. Because milk composition changes. It's less watery and a little, a little bit more fatty to uh, answer baby's needs because yes. baby is growing and needs different components. So in other words, your body is just basically adjusting to Correct. no longer being in that newborn stage, no longer being newly postpartum. It's, it's adjusting to, you know, the, the new needs of your baby in terms of their appetite and, and what they need to take down. And as a result of not feeling full all the time, it, it does not mean that your milk is gone, unlike what many of us, including myself, absolutely. <laughs> initially feared. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. This is absolutely right. Because usually what you are looking at, you are looking at baby's weight gain, which is again, not going to be one kilo a month at four yes. months. Baby starting to move, turn from side to side, a little bit more energetic. Yes. But if adequately gaining weight, peeing enough and pooping enough, and if the boobs feeling deflated, we're still doing good and we're still lactating. Yes. That's fantastic. Okay. No, I'm like really, really glad that we just, you know, conquered that because, you know, a lot of the families that I work with, you know, the breastfeeding moms in particular might feel fearful to what, remove some of those night feeds from their five month olds waking up every two hours all night long, thinking that their milk supply is already going down when really it's a very normal part of the breastfeeding relationship by that stage is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. It's not going to affect as much as, as it has been told. Yes. Yes. It, okay. Can we it's talk a different about stage. pacifiers? because pacifiers and breast definitely you know i personally i happen to love pacifiers as a sleep tool um you know if all three of my kids took them my my 22 month old still sleeps with, with with one at night i think they're amazing um the million dollar question and they're and sorry and they're particularly fantastic for newborns, they are because, you know, newborns, they have a very strong sucking reflex. And, you know, if mom doesn't feel like being a human pacifier all the time, you can offer the baby an actual physical pacifier to help him calm and relax. That being said, there's a lot of discussion around when the best time is to introduce a pacifier to a newborn when the mother intends to breastfeed. So what are your thoughts on that particular topic? So my answer usually is if we want a great milk supply um, before four to six weeks, not to introduce any bottles or any pacifiers. Mm -hmm. However, if you want bottle and pacifier in your life, four to six weeks, it's a great time to introduce it and don't postpone it for later. Because okay. otherwise you are going to get exclusive breastfeeder or as I call them, boob lover, yeah. who is going to be just connected to the breast. And I see this problem a lot uh, among the moms who are saying, tomorrow I'm flying to Hawaii to my friend's wedding and baby is exclusively breastfeeding. How my partner is going to feed this baby? Yeah. And I'm asking, where have you been before? Right. Um, I'm always very pro. Baby needs to know other way to feed, mm -hmm. which is a bottle. And yeah. at six weeks of age or four weeks of age, I don't think the latch is going to be, um, it's not going to go down from one bottle a day at night. Yeah. Right. But, but it's also going to create a very good um, teaching and learning with the baby who knows I'm not only breastfeeding from a breast, I can feed from a bottle. Same with, uh, with the pacifier. Mm -hmm. Four to six weeks, definitely a time to introduce it because later on your baby will say, no, I need the breast to calm down. Right, right, right. And so you don't find 
that the pacifier is any different than the bottle, even though the bottle has milk and the pacifier doesn't. Like you think that they both can potentially cause a bit of nipple confusion when the baby is I am, before that. I am part. not in in my practice, I am not a huge fan of this um, nipple confusion thing, to be honest with you. Okay. Because I saw very many babies who even live in the NICU and eating mostly from the bottle, transition into exclusive breastfeeding after. Uh -huh. I have to say that I also saw a baby who took one to two bottles and then we'll, we needed to work on his latch for a very long time. Very individual basis, but mm -hmm. I am more um, pro-flow confusion. Okay. So, so the bottle, introducing the bottle too soon because the bottle yes. has milk is one thing. Introducing the pacifier after a few days or so, it's not the same concern. It's a bit different voice. thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of course, the pacifier doesn't need to be there to replace the feeding, right? Yes. But that's, that's, that's the key, right? Is to be offering the pacifier to the baby after the baby has fed as a means of helping the right. baby soothe rather than using it to push off a feed or replace a feed. Correct. Because Correct. then that, of course, can affect breastfeeding. And also, I'm always saying if you drive in a car and baby is on a back seat mm -hmm. and like you can't offer the breast at the moment, but no. whoever sees their calming the hysterical baby down, I see more pros than cones in this situation right. when a uh, pacifier has been offered. Right. Uh, going back to the bottles, when I'm talking about flow confusion versus nipple confusion, uh, when we're given a bottle full of milk and it's just dripping into baby's mouth, what baby learns from this process that at the moment I will do the sack, I'll get a reward for this. I'll get my food for this. Yeah. And when he comes back to the breast, he expect, uh, expects the same effects, right. which is not happening. We know that mechanism of bottle feeding and mechanism of breastfeeding, it's a bit different mechanism. Right. So if you're asking me about like the shape of the nipple uh, and like, how, like the shape can confuse the baby. I see that less. Um, I see more that baby usually confused because of the high flow coming from the bottle. Right. And that's why we usually advise not to use any bottles at the beginning. If baby needs to be topped up, mm -hmm. we're using finger feeding and, um, and tube at the breast. Uh, as a like as a tool to help baby to supplement right but also I have to say uh, if I see mom who is sleep deprived and not able to manage with all of this I will say feed the baby this is the first yes uh, my uh, philosophical pyramid is a bit different because my pyramid says first of all maternal mental health second of all feed the baby doesn't matter from which star source mm -hmm. third uh produce the milk and only fourth find the way in which you are feeding your baby is it a bottle is it a breast right okay i'm talking about different and like it's a bit different than maybe in our lactation consultant uh world we're presenting to parents I but think I it's do the way that it should be. I yeah. think that's, that's, that's the way it needs to be. And, you know, I'll tell you, um, because I, as when I was a first time mom, I had some very direct experience with breastfeeding support that did not take the same stance as you. And I have to tell you, unfortunately, you know, as a first time mom, my introduction to the world of lactation support was a very negative one. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll tell you all what happened. So my, my oldest daughter, who's now nine, um, when she was born, she was born, she was a full term, you know, healthy pregnancy, low, low risk, no complications until she was born. She was born after a very 
long labor and um, came out of the womb, surprisingly, um, barely breathing, actually not breathing at all. Her, her one minute APGAR score was a one out of 10. Wow. <laughs> So um, for, for those of you Scary. who don't know what an APGAR score is, I don't blame you. I'll tell you the only reason why I know what an APGAR score is, is because my firstborn child was born with an APGAR of one, which is basically the first well-being test that newborns get upon being born. They're looking at, they look at heartbeat, they look at breathing, they're looking at skin tone, reflexes, you know, muscle tone. Um, overall, how is the baby doing? And so the only reason why she got, oh, and it's out of 10. And so most, most babies, when a baby is born healthy, they should be born at the one minute mark at what, a seven, an eight, a nine, something like that, Sophia? Yeah, eight and nine. Yeah, so she was born at a one because she had a faint heartbeat and nothing else. So naturally, she was whisked right off to the NICU and she was placed on um, what's I guess, known as a brain cooling machine. There's this yes. fairly new technology. I don't, I can't remember what the exact medical term is, but it's otherwise known as brain cooling. It calls, as, it calls cooling process. Yes. Uh, it reduces the uh, metabolism of the body. And this way, uh, be, like, you know, to restore all the power of baby's brain. It's, it's basically my then, understanding then warming the baby you know, from, from when she was undergoing it was if, if she was, because obviously she was born completely asphyxiated, you know, not breathing whatsoever, we did not know how long she was in distress for, which has the potential to cause brain damage. And so the idea behind this treatment is that it's meant to prevent further brain damage. Um, and so she was on this cooling pad for Correct. a 72 hour period where Obviously, I'm not able to breastfeed, so the whole, the whole, my, my whole birth plan went out the window. Skin to skin, putting her on the breast initially, that all went out the window. And so she was you know, being fed through an IV. Um, I was pumping over those few days, you know, trying to get my, my supply up. And then after that 72 hour period where they took her off the brain cooling machine, I remember they then whisked her right off for a, an MRI on her brain uh, to see what was going on. So they had to sedate her for that. And so by the time I was able to hold her, she was you know three and a half days old. And then from there for another few days, they still weren't allowing me to try putting her to the breast because um, they wanted to make sure that her digestive organs were working okay. And so they wanted to feed her my milk through a syringe to be able to track how much she was taking in, how much was coming out, et cetera. And so by the time I was able to actually try nursing her, she was a week old. Now, it's obviously not impossible to get a baby to latch in this scenario, but it's significantly more challenging, right? Goes without saying. On top of that, Correct. I'm a first time mom and I just experienced a really traumatic birth that by the way, the trauma at that point hadn't gone away because the MRI results came back. They saw something on her brain they didn't really like. The, the main thing that they were looking out for, guys, and I, I actually didn't really know this until about a week into the whole process, they were worried about cerebral palsy. That's the main thing that these neonatologists and specialists were looking out for. Now, I will just tell you all, spoiler alert, my nine-year-old is 100% healthy, thank God, no cerebral palsy, no complications. But at the same time, we didn't know what was going to be. You know, nine, this is, you know, over nine years ago now. And so here I am, I'm this first time mom, I'm, I'm, I'm pumping, I'm finger feeding, I'm using, you know, all these various different um, lactation aids that the, that the consultants gave me. I'm trying to get her to lack, she's refusing. And I'm, I literally, I called it like breastfeeding boot camp, you know, just constantly, constantly trying. And I remember a couple of weeks in, um, the, the NICU lactation consultant gave me a call, you know, just to check in, which was very nice of her, but it was very business-like. It was very much like, so is the baby latching yet? No. Are you, are you pumping every three hours? Yes. Are you, have you used this device? Have you tried this? Have you tried that? And not once did any of these professionals during that two week period in the NICU, not once did any of them ask me, how are you doing? 
I kid you not. And this is a um, level three NICU. This is a level three NICU, guys. I know. And there are some very sick babies. There are some really very high risk babies in this NICU where these parents have undergone a huge trauma depending on the, for, for whatever reason. And not once did anyone ask me, how am I doing? And as crazy as it was to think, it didn't even occur to me that my well-being mattered. It really didn't. And I'll tell you when I, I did realize. So again, I'm, this is about two to three weeks in to me pumping and finger feeding and trying to get her to latch. And I sort of got her to latch and I'm working with people and I'm, I'm, you know, just, it's a constant around the clock endeavor. And I, I gave, I wasn't comfortable with those professionals at that particular hospital. And so I gave an acquaintance of mine a call who was also a lactation consultant. And, and I just, I had a question for her about one of the devices I was using just a you, it doesn't even matter what the, I didn't even remember, I don't even remember what the question is, but I remember, I remember her response. She said to me, she goes, Eva, let's, let's not talk about finger feeding for a second. She goes, how are you doing? Are you okay? She said, you know, you've been through a lot and you sound a little bit stressed. And I remember I kind of froze. And then I remember breaking down in tears because this was the first person who had ever asked me, how am I doing? And you know what the answer was? I was terrible. <laughs> I was an absolute wreck because I had gone through an insanely traumatic experience that by the way, did not have a happy ending yet. You know, we still weren't sure. She was only a few weeks old. We were tracking her. She was in the NICU developmental follow-up program, you know, to make sure that she's meeting her milestones and whatnot. So, you know, the last chapter still had not been written. I'm not sleeping. I'm barely eating. All I'm doing is trying to nurse her 24 seven. And she then said to me, because I, I broke down in tears, I said, I'm not doing well. And, but it didn't even occur to me that that should matter. And that was when she said to me, she goes, Eva, you know, your baby needs a happy mommy. And um, I want to I support you here. I want to support you with whatever your breastfeeding goals are, but it has to also be in the context of you being okay. It was like, my I don't know why as a new mom, that was something so, um, it, it was like a new concept to me. It, 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 it wasn't something that I had heard. And I just, I think if there's something that I could scream from the rooftops, it's that even though breastfeeding is wonderful, what's more important than that is your mental health. Like that is, that is Absolutely. step number one, is making sure that you are at Absolutely. the top, you and your mental health is at the top of that totem pole. Because if we'll look at this and we'll see that, yes, breastfeeding achieved, check. But if together with this, mom is losing her mind. I was losing and her mind. Not able to, not able to continue further. We have a lot in front of us. Baby will start crawling and walking and running and solids and this and that and the other we need energy for this too right and if we're putting all of our energy into one goal which is very very important goal i'm very pro breastfeeding and i think it's like it's very important to breastfeed not in every price no it no. should like the, the the price for that should be very logical and balanced with who you are and how you're feeling at the moment mm -hmm. and like how much you are able to pay for this you know yeah. what i mean absolutely absolutely I, I i don't know i think that it was so sad that inquiring into my well-being was something that it, it didn't even occur to me that it mattered and now, you know, looking back, you know, being far from a first time mom, um, I think that that is a message that every, that every mom undergoing breastfeeding challenges really needs to, really needs to digest. 
because it's it's huge. Absolutely. It's Absolutely. And usually what we absorb uh, from the information given to us, it's like, oh, you have a new baby. Baby is like not doing anything for you for himself. You need to do everything for himself. From now on, you are responsible. Yeah. And we're taking this responsibility deep down to our guts. But if we're not stopping at some point and not saying, hey, am I okay? Am I okay to continue? We can be in big troubles. Yeah. Amazing. Sophia, if there is one thing that you could tell, you know, a new mom that is struggling with breastfeeding, you know, in some way, shape or form, like if there's one thing that you could just scream off the rooftops, your, your fight song, <laughs> what, what would it be? Probably it would be, I like, I know you are very, um, concerned and I know it takes like 90% of your mind right now, but stop for a second, breathe for a second and ask for a second, what can I do for myself? Cause you matter. You matter. You matter. You definitely matter. And yeah. without you, this whole breastfeeding would not continue. Yes. Yes. I love it. I love it. Sophia, thank you yeah. so much for coming on. So you guys, if you ever had a welcome, doubt my dear, as about old, as always. whether or not sleep and breastfeeding can go and mental health can all go hand in hand, just ask my wonderful friend, Absolutely. Sophia Brainin. Clearly, she will say that they all can and should go hand in hand. So Sophia, people want more of you in their lives. Where can they find you? So I have an account on Instagram. It's a like regular Sophia Brining account, uh, Facebook with all my credentials and all the information, my uh, Gmail, my phone number on a top of picture of my Facebook. Uh, I'm there. Fantastic. Okay. So I will grab those links from you to put them in the show notes. Okay. Well, that is about it. Thank you so much for your time, Sophia. Have a wonderful day, My everyone. My pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye.